الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد. So the purpose of this session is a Q&A following on from the lecture about our purpose in life and there were some important questions that were raised. I'm going to take two or three questions that I was asked and I'm going to answer those questions inshallah ta'ala uh, and then I'll open it up to other people. So the first question that I remember a brother came and asked me is with regard to the teachings of these alphabets, LGBT and all the other letters that go with it in school, how can we as parents manage this and how can we sort of deal with the fact that even in Islamic schools it may be mandatory by law for a certain amount of teaching to happen. So there's no doubt that Islam came to eliminate al-munkar, to eliminate everything which is evil and to eliminate everything which is hated by Allah. But there are situations in which this cannot be eliminated completely. So what is obligatory in this situation is to reduce the evil as much as possible. Any the munkar that cannot be completely removed. So there are some people can completely remove it. Any they can take their kids out of the lesson, they can uh, homeschool their kids, they can go to... Any some people they have a way to completely remove this evil. There are other people they do not. All they can do is taqlil al-munkar, take it as small as possible. Now, if someone is asking how to cope with this, so for example, an Islamic school says, look, we know this is something hated to Allah. However, this is something that by law we have to teach. So we teach the minimum amount possible. What is your advice with regard to the school and with regard to the parents? So with regard to the school, my first advice is everything that is haram that you can remove, remove it. Everything that is haram you cannot remove from a curriculum. My advice is that you decrease it as much as possible and that perhaps the best way to deal with it is a factual basis rather than an opinion based answer. So for example, let's take a different topic. Let's say somebody is talking about Darwin's theory of evolution. So this is mandatory in the sciences, at least in biology, that the children have to be taught Darwinian's theory of evolution. But there are two ways I can teach this. I can teach it in a way that is factual or opinionated. Factual meaning Charles Darwin was a man. Charles Darwin lived in this time. Charles Darwin had a theory. This was Charles Darwin's theory. Khalas. I'm not giving you any opinion. I'm not telling you this is the haqq. And in fact, as an Islamic school, you can probably say, we totally disagree with this theory from beginning to end, and this theory is batil because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us so in the Quran. But the point is, when I teach it like that, this is a theory that exists, that's it. So for example, some schools said, we have to teach, for example, gay marriage to a certain extent. Yeah, but you're teaching it as something beloved, something good, or you're just teaching as a fact that in this country, this certain thing exists. And it exists in this country. It is something that some people in this country do. That, that, that is very important that we don't teach it in a way that is beloved or in a way that makes people admire it or in a way that people makes people aspire to it. But if we must teach it, it's a fact. I mean, there are people in this country, yes, finish. From the view of the parent or the school, it is also really important for the children to be firmly grounded in the Islamic responses to the haram that they experience at school. From this is, for example, that in an age-appropriate way, the child is given the Islamic answer to this particular issue. For example, if we're talking about Darwin's theory of evolution, then very simple, that Allah Azza wa Jal created Adam from Turab. خَلَقَهُ مِن Turab. He created him from dust. And that Adam did not evolve from any animal. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, إِنَّ مَثَلَ عِيسَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ كَمَثَلِ آدَمْ 
The example of Isa in the sight of Allah is like the example of Adam. He created him from dust and then he said, be in it is. That's enough for a young child to understand that Darwin's theory is wrong and that this is what Islam says. However, later as the child gets older, that's not enough. And as the child reaches the age of the, the near the GCSE exams of the teens, they have questions. They want to know about what about Peking man and this you know, fossil and that thing. So now they need a jawabun mufassal. They need an answer that is detailed. And they need someone to give them the proper Islamic answer to that. What you must not do is let this munkar settle into the hearts of a, of a child. So in the beginning, it's a simple answer. So in the beginning, a young child, by fitra, every young child knows that marriage is mom and dad. Yani this is fitri. Yani they, this is fitra. They don't need anything else. And we know that, for example, they learn about the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ married Khadija and they had, you know, their six, the six children that came from Khadija radiallahu anha, the Prophet ﷺ. That's enough for them in the beginning. But as they get older, they will need a detailed answer to the issues that are presented to them. And the issue of Islam submitting to Allah and Allah knows best what is right for us and what is good for us, this is very important also. So that's the way I would deal with that. As a school, reduce it as much as possible, try to eliminate it where possible. As a parent, do the same. And where you cannot and you reduce it to the minimum, address the Islamic issues. Because Islam has an answer for everything. But a lot of the times what I see from parents is that parents don't address this issue. It's just hands on the ears, close the eyes, bury the head in the sand and pretend it doesn't happen. But then the children grow up with these munkarat in their hearts and maybe they even grow to love them or they even grow to approve of them or they even grow to believe they're not that bad. So it's very important for us that we challenge those issues and we give them the proper Islamic understanding at an age-appropriate way. Because the wrong understanding at the wrong age is also harmful, right? If we give a young child too much information, it's also harmful. Like the famous statement, طعام الكبير سم الصغير أو طعام الكبار سم الصغار That the food of the old is poison for the young. Yani if you're going to give a young child something that's not appropriate to their age, it's going to confuse them even more. So you give each an appropriate, an appropriate answer to the age of the child and as they get exposed to more stuff in school, you give them more Islamic answers and you try to give the answers before they observe those things so that they're able to understand and be able to contextualize it in the light of Islam. The second question that I got answered, or the second question I got asked and I'm going to try to answer inshallah, is with regard to some people who we mentioned the issue of praying at the graves, and what they say is they say, we are not going to the grave to pray to the person in the grave. Rather, we're going to the grave to pray to Allah by asking Allah through the deeds of that person or through the status of that person. Like the statement of a person, Allahumma inni as'aluka bi jahi fulan. Oh Allah, I ask you by the honor of this person. Or, oh Allah, I ask you by the good deeds of this person. There are two important answers to this. The first is that this method of tawassul is tawassulun bid'i. It is an innovation. The Prophet ﷺ didn't do it. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum didn't do it. It doesn't come in any of the types of tawassul mentioned in the Quran and it doesn't come in the tawassul mentioned in the Sunnah. And we mentioned the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha that the Prophet said, Man amila amalan laysa alayhi amruna fahuwa rad. Whoever does an action that is not in accordance with our sunnah, it will be rejected. So it's very important we understand this idea of asking Allah by the status of the Prophet وسلم, or the honor of the Kaaba or the deeds of this person or yani, the, the status of this person. All of this, ma anzalallahu biha min sultan. Allah never gave anyone permission to do it. And our understanding is that the way we worship Allah is tawqifiyah. We worship Allah the way the Prophet ﷺ did it. That's it. We don't have any other option. This is the first answer. So if we look at the tawassul that came in the Quran, we find tawassul with Allah's names and attributes. Rabbana, uh, 
For example, Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samir alim. Our Lord, accept from us, you are the one who hears everything and knows everything. We also find tawassul by our good deeds. Rabbana innana amanna faghfir lana. Oh, our Lord, we have believed, so forgive us. We find tawassul by mentioning the outcome that we want. Rabbana liyuqimu salah, my Lord, so they may perform the prayer. La'allahum wa la'allahum yashkurun, so that they may show gratitude and so on. But we don't find anywhere in the Quran, oh Allah, I ask you by the honor of Ibrahim, or I ask you by the honor of Muhammad Sallallahu or I ask you by the status of Jibreel. This never came in the Quran, nor did it come in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There are some areas in the Sunnah where people might be confused, like al istisqa They said, we used to ask Allah through the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and now we are asking him through the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is not a tawassul bijahi fulan. This is not asking Allah by someone's status. Rather, this is asking them to make dua in front of you and then you saying, Ameen. And this is not from the type of tawassul which is prohibited in the first place. And that is why after the Prophet ﷺ died, if they were making dua through his status, why did they not carry on when he died? Did his status end when he died? It didn't. So with istisqa, when they were asking for rain, if they were asking through the status of the Prophet ﷺ, why did they stop and change to Al-Abbas? Except that the Prophet ﷺ died, his status didn't die, his deeds didn't die. So why did they stop asking him? Because they were not asking by his status in the first place. They were asking him to go and make dua, and then they would ask Allah, Oh Allah, your messenger made dua, accept it. And the same thing with Al-Abbas. Al-Abbas would make dua for rain, and the people would ask Allah to accept that dua. The other thing in this question is very important, is a lot of people use this as an excuse. And in reality, a person so excuses don't benefit them. Even if the person gives all of their excuses, in reality, a person goes to the grave. We see them making sajda, we see them grabbing onto the sides of the graves and crying. We see them calling upon the person and they say, I'm not calling upon them, I'm asking Allah. But the reality is that Allah Azawajal never legislated you to go to that place to ask. Nor did Allah Azawajal give you a sunnah from the Prophet Sallallahu to go to that place. So be careful about people who fool themselves. They don't fool us, but they fool themselves by telling themselves, I'm going there through the status of the wali. When in reality, they're going there for the wali himself. So this is very important. That was another uh, important question that we were asked. We had the third one. Habibis, help me out with the third one, because I'll forget. Um, it was when, when they do dua in congregation. Very good. I remember exactly the question now. So this is with regard to the dua that is made in congregation often at certain days when a person died, uh, the khatam and things like that. Uh, and the issue of someone who is upon the sunnah and they feel compelled to attend because of family ties. So we know it's very important to keep family ties in Islam. Allah Azza wa Jalla said, فَهَلْ عَسَيْتُمْ إِن تَوَلَّيْتُمْ أَن تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَتُقَطِّعُوا أَرْحَامَكُمْ Do you think that if you turn away that you will cause corruption in the earth or you will cut off from your relatives. However, there is a principle we must believe, we must f implement it and we must keep it in our mind. And that is لا طاعة لمخلوق في معصية الخالق You cannot do something for creation that is disobeying Allah. Doesn't matter your parents or anyone else, like Allah Azza wa Jal said. وَإِن جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِمَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ if they try to compel you to make a partner with me in what you have no knowledge, do not obey them, but accompany them in this world in the best way. This is the best answer I can give to the person in this situation. Don't obey them. Be along with people in the best way, but don't obey them. For my advice is that these gatherings are gatherings that are either built upon shirk, upon making a partner with Allah, or if they are free from that, they are built upon bid'ah, going against the Prophet So I don't believe that anyone should be attending these gatherings at all. If a person is in the house when the gathering takes place, let them move away. 
فلا تقعدوا معهم حتى يخوضوا في حديث غيره. Don't sit with them until they take a different speech, a different path. If a person feels compelled that they are in the room, don't take part. Ikhwani, I know a lot of people, I know how hard it is. And I know the brothers say, look, I raise my hand and I just ask Allah for forgiveness. Or I raise my hands and I ask Allah for something halal. But at the end of the day, you're taking part in this thing with them. They don't even see them that you are doing inkar al-munkar. They don't see that you, you reject it. They don't see they're doing anything wrong. So I think what you should do is that you should not take part. But you should make dua for the dead person and show the family your sincerity towards them. So for example, the family say, okay, everybody read now. So I say, I'm not going to read. May Allah forgive this person. May Allah give him al-Furtaus al-Alam al-Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, shower his mercy upon him. I can't take part in this. Because I can't disobey Allah to make you happy. And when they finish, you make dua for the dead person. You mention, you show how sincere, you comfort the family, you say kind words to them. But don't take part in something that is ma'asiyatillah wa ma'asiyatil rasul. Disobeying Allah Azza wa and disobeying the Messenger Sallallahu And don't feel that people will say and people will think. Show sincerity, show your kindness, look after the family, take care of them, say nice words to them. Make dua for the dead person, but don't take part in something that is disobedience to Allah and disobedience to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam under any circumstances. Wallahu alam. And Allah Azza wa knows best. Okay. Closely related, can a Muslim attend a non-Muslim relative's funeral? No, I don't believe that they should tend attend a non-Muslim relative's funeral. Uh, it's true that if their non-Muslim relative has no one to bury them, like the situation that happened with Abu Talib, there was no one to bury him and nobody would prepare the body to put it in the grave. So Ali radiallahu anh, he asked the Prophet وسلم, and the Prophet وسلم, gave him permission to take that responsibility. So if there is no one to bury the person and nobody is there to, to bury them, they would just be left by themselves, then the person can take care of their burial but not to attend their funeral. Because that funeral, first of all, is the funeral of a non-Muslim. Second of all, it's going to be based upon practices from another religion or atheism. And since the person was not a Muslim, it's not permissible for a person to participate in that. Rather, a person can go to the family, say words of you know, condolences or what have you. You can say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Because that's true no matter what. Yani we are all belonging to Allah and we will all go back to Him. But it's very important a person doesn't exaggerate in this issue and doesn't get involved in the issues of the non-Muslims now. Can parents deny marriage due to nationality? Uh, this is an important question that we must be a little bit careful about. There's no doubt that the measure in the sight of Allah is a taqwa. Inna akramakum indallahi atqakum. The ones who are the most noble in the sight of Allah are the people of a taqwa. Allah Azawajal doesn't look at inna Allah la yanzuru ila suarikum. Allah doesn't look at how you look. But Allah looks at but Allah looks at your hearts and Allah looks at your deeds. At the same time, there is one aspect of nationality that could be given consideration when it comes to marriage. And that is an issue of compatibility. Now, I don't believe compatibility is necessarily aligned with nationality. For example, you can have two people from different ethnicities or different nationalities that are compatible. But it is important to make sure that there will be compatibility. In the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in the Athar, we see that there were occasionally marital problems between the people of Quraysh in Mecca and the Ansar in Medina. Both of them are from the same ethnicity, the same nationality, broadly speaking, and there were problems between the two of them. And these problems came about because of a lack of compatibility, different expectations, different culture. So there is no issue that Islam says you must marry someone of the same ethnicity or nationality, nor is there any reason to prevent it on that basis. But it is important to make sure that the husband and wife are compatible with one another. That means that they understand each other's cultures, they understand the expectations, 
and they are comfortable with what each one of them will expect from the other. If the parent is refusing the marriage based on this issue, compatibility, this could be given some consideration. And you could say to them, tell me, for example, you go to the wali, the wali says, you are not marrying this person from this nationality. Okay, what is your reason? If he says, my reason is because they will not understand our culture, our expectations, we will not understand theirs, they, they have some things they expect from their women and you have some things we expect and it's not gonna work out. This should be thought about. I'm not saying he's right, but it should be given consideration. But if it's just racism, or it's just a matter of nothing but any ethnicity or nationality or race, this has no consideration in the sight of Allah. Inna akramakum atqakum. The most noble in the sight of Allah are the ones with the most taqwa. At the same time, do I advise or do I advise, uh, do I give advice that a person should go against their parents in this issue? My honest advice is to be very careful and cautious. Don't rush to go against your parents in this issue. Yes, they could be wrong. Yes, there can be jahil there. There can be ignorance there. But ultimately, going against your parents is not easy. And it's not light in the sight of Allah So just think about the issue first. Consult people of knowledge. Ask people who are senior to you. Ask people who are older than you. Don't rush to go against your parents because your parents don't want you to marry from this culture or that culture. But be careful about this, wallahi. Because even if your parents in this might be wrong, there is no doubt that going against the parents is very, very severe in the sight of Allah. And you have to have a very, very good reason for it. So just be careful about the issue of going against your parents. Like some of the young people, they just quickly want to take the answer and see my parents are wrong. I told the girl left the house. And she goes to any imam and the imam becomes her wali and the imam gets her married. And that's it. She lost the connection with her parents for a long, long time, maybe forever. It's not uh, It's not something easy and light. Rather, she should take good advice and counsel and think very, very carefully before taking that step. Okay. Okay. If a parent finds their children watching something which is haram, how should they deal with it? So my sincere advice to the parent in this situation is to take things slowly and to try to communicate with your child and to try to explain to them. Because in reality, as a parent, it's one of the worst things that can happen to you. To see your child doing something which is openly haram, to see your child doing something which can ruin their akhirah, it hurts you as a parent. And your initial reaction is and it, extremely severe upon them, and it should be. But at the same time, in reality, your job is to do the means that is gonna bring about a change in that child. So you sit down with them and you say, what you are doing here is very severe in the sight of Allah And the stuff that you're involved in is absolutely haram and it's not acceptable at all. So now we have to understand why this happened and we have to remove every single thing that leads to it. Is it your phone? Is it your uh, computer? Is it your friends? Whatever it is, we're gonna change it. And first of all, you need to tell them to repent to Allah before they feel sorry in front of their parents. Because a lot of kids are like, oh, I'm really sorry, I'm really sorry, I'm really sorry, I got caught. Any, but they don't feel in their heart any pain in terms of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is also very important. Can we eat food that has been read upon from a khatam? No, I don't believe you can eat it. Wallahu a'lam. Can you forgive? I don't eat birthday cake either. Yani. I don't believe you can eat birthday cake or Christmas cake or yani, something which has been prepared for something haram. You can't eat it. How can you forgive someone who has done wrong to you? Let them forgive and overlook. Don't you want Allah to forgive you? So the simplest way is to concentrate on your forgiveness from Allah. If you concentrate on your forgiveness from Allah and you concentrate on Allah's names and attributes like Al-Ghafoor, uh, Al-Ghaffar, uh, Tawwab, Al-Rahim, Al-Rahman, if you look at these attributes of Allah and you understand them and you realize how much you need Allah's forgiveness for you, 
This will enable you to learn to forgive other people. Because Allah said, forgive and pardon. Don't you want Allah to forgive you? This ayah has a story, the ayah in Surah An-Nur. Uh, it has a story. And the story behind this is the ifk which happened to Aisha radiallahu anha. You know that Aisha, she was accused of adultery radiallahu anha. And Allah declared her to be innocent in the Quran. There were some Muslims who were involved in spreading the rumors about Aisha. They were not, they were munafiqeen, yes. But there were some Muslims who got involved. They took the rumor and they spread it by, by without realizing what they were doing or without knowing the severity of what they were doing. Among them was a Sahabi who was known as Mistah. And he was from the relatives of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Abu Bakr used to pay for his upkeep. He was a poor man. And Abu Bakr used to pay for him. And subhanallah, Mista fell into spreading the, the rumor about Aisha. Imagine that. The person who is paying for you, the person who is paying for your upkeep, the person who is looking after you, and you betray them with the biggest betrayal that you can imagine. And you spread rumors about their daughter to the extent that she almost was divorced from the Prophet ﷺ because of it. Abu Bakr, he swore an oath by Allah. By Allah, I'm never going to give this man again. And Allah Azza wa Jal revealed the ayah. Let them forgive and overlook. Don't you want for Allah to forgive you? And after the ayah came down, Abu Bakr, he said, Wallahi, I'm never going to stop giving to him. And he continued to give to him until any the time that he passed away. Radiallahu anhum ajma'in. So reading the seerah also is a means to learn how to forgive because when you read things like that, it teaches you the etiquettes and the manners of how to forgive. Is having a baby shower permissible? Not like that, like the way they call it a baby shower. Wallahi, the Prophet said, وَمَن تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمٍ فَهُوَ مِنْهُمْ Whoever resembles a people is one of them. So we don't take the non-Muslims habits, we don't take their celebrations, we don't take the way they give gifts, we don't do anything the way that they do it. The Prophet said, Khalifu Yahuda wa Nasara. Be different from the Jews and the Christians. In many ahadith, in many ahadith, he told us, be different from the Jews and the Christians. And he said, shibran, shibran, and He said, You're gonna follow the ways of the people who came before you, hand span by hand span and arm by arm. So, yes, give gifts to a person who's gonna have a baby. Buy clothes for the baby, buy gifts for the baby, no problem. But don't copy the way the non-Muslims do it. This having baby showers and things like that. I explained about the khatab, alhamdulillah. Uh, With regard to the milad of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is uh, something that's been answered very well previously. So there are some excellent videos, but I will just summarize a few points. First of all, there is no one who loved the Prophet ﷺ more than the Sahaba. They loved the Prophet ﷺ more than we could ever love him. Wallahi, if we gathered the love that everyone on this earth has for the Prophet ﷺ, it would not reach, not even a mud, not even a handspan of what Abu Bakr had for the Prophet ﷺ. And Abu Bakr never celebrated the Prophet ﷺ's birthday, nor did Umar nor did Uthman, nor did Ali radiallahu anhum ajma'in, nor did any of the Sahaba, nor did any of the Tabi'een, nor did any of the Imams of Islam, Abu Hanifa and Malik and Shafi'i and Ahmed rahimahumullah ta'ala. None of them did. In fact, it's so rare and unlikely and so unusual that we don't even know when the Prophet was born. Do you know that? We don't know when the Prophet was born. The scholars differed, they didn't even agree the month he is born. Most of them said Rabi'ul Awwal, but not all of them. They even differed over the month he was born. They agreed the year he was born, Amul Field. They agreed that he was born in the year of the elephant. But they didn't agree upon the month and they didn't agree upon the day. Rather, I will say that me personally, I believe that the date of the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal is wrong. It's not the day the Prophet was born. Rather, I think it more likely he was born upon the 8th of Rabi' al-Awwal, possibly the 10th of Rabi' al-Awwal, or possibly the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal, that those are the three stronger opinions in the issue. So the scholars of Sirah don't even agree when he was born, so how shall we celebrate his birthday? They don't even agree upon the date that he was born. That's the next thing. 
The third thing is who started celebrating his birthday. Khwani was the Fatimiyun, the extreme Shia. They're so extreme that even the Shia of today consider them kuffar. Yani they, are the, yani they are from among the most extreme of the extreme Shia. And they celebrated six birthdays. They started it. Nobody did it before them. These people, this is the ones who started it. Six birthdays. The birthday of the Prophet Sallallahu The birthday of Fatima radiallahu anha. The birthday of Ali radiallahu anha. The birthday of Al-Hasan. And the birthday of Al-Hussein radiallahu anhuma. And the birthday of their king. And they celebrate, they started these six birthdays. Nobody in Islam knew something called the Prophet's birthday until these people came. No, none of the Imams of Islam, they never knew it. For wallahi, we should suffice ourselves with what the Sahaba suffice themselves with. Qul in kuntum tuhibbun Allah fattabi'uni. Say if you love Allah, then follow the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there are much more detailed answers, inshallah, than that. But this is just a small Q&A, so small points, inshallah. How do you control your child choosing friends at school? Uh, first of all, my advice with regard to the children is the first thing you can do is there are, there are two things you can do before they even go to school. One is by teaching them good Islamic morals and manners. They themselves will know a good friend from a bad friend. That's the first thing. The second thing is by encouraging them to have good friends before they go to school and while they're at school, then inshallah, as they go from stage to stage and year to year, they will continue to have good friends. As for when your child is at school, you can certainly influence them. As a parent, you have a lot of control over your children in the sense that you can, let's say, give them a lot of leeway or you can put a lot of pressure. So my advice is when they have bad friends that are bad for them in their religion, restrict them to the maximum that you can restrict them. Can I go out late? No. Can I go to this house? No. Can I use No. And you restrict everything you can. When it comes to their good friends, this is important, don't forget this. When it comes to their good friends, let it go. Can I stay a bit late? No problem. Can I stay over their house? Of course you can. What about if we meet up at the weekend? No problem, inshallah. And encourage them with what is good and prevent them with what is bad. And explain to them. Because so many times parents just say no, and kids are just like, look, my, my parents just say no, they don't want good for me, they don't know what it's like. Talk to them, explain to them why it is that you want to say no and what the problem might be. I apologize that these answers are very brief, but we've got, a, Allahumma barik, we've got some papers here. A person believes it is fine to share pictures of his wife on social media. Using the fatwa of a Sheikh al-Albani, rahimahullah ta'ala, that covering the face is not compulsory, SubhanAllah, this in regard to, you know, SubhanAllah, the amount of people I see, Wallahi, following a fatwa, they don't understand. But in reality, the reason they're following it is because it is in agreement with their hawa. So this person falls under the statement of Allah, Have you seen the one who took his God as his desires? Because this person is not sincere in following what the Shaykh said. Did the Shaykh give a fatwa of posting your wife's picture around for everyone to look at? No, he didn't. Rahimahullah ta'ala. Never would the Shaykh say such a thing. Rahimahullah ta'ala. Rather, the Shaykh spoke about whether it is obligatory for a Muslim woman to cover her face. As for the issue of lowering the gaze, there is no ikhtilaf in it at all. There is no two Muslim scholars who ever differed on the obligation of lowering the gaze. And that is lowering the gaze, whether the woman is not wearing hijab or wearing hijab or wearing niqab or not wearing niqab, whatever it is. Nobody differed on the, permit, on the obligation of lowering the gaze that came in the text of the Quran and the Sunnah. For this issue, subhanAllah, is very, very unfortunate. I will give you one evidence to explain. Sheikh al-Albani, from the evidences he brought that the niqab is not obligatory. By the way, I believe it's obligatory, but the Sheikh rahimahullah ta'ala from the evidences he brought is the hadith which mentions uh, Al-Fadl, uh, Al-Fadl ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, that a woman came and she was Al-Mar'ah al khatamiya as I remember, and this woman that the Prophet وسلم, took his nephew's head, or he, he took the, his cousin's head, and he turned it backwards. 
he took his head and he turned it around. The point is the Sheikh is using this to show that the woman's face was uncovered. The point here is, let's just take what the Sheikh said on that statement. Now, how should you behave when you see that woman whose face is uncovered? The same way as Al-Fadl behaved. Turn your head all the way backwards. Or do you believe in some things in the, in the hadith and you don't believe in others? And if you believe that that is the evidence why the woman's face was uncovered. Okay, the woman's face was uncovered. The Prophet ﷺ took Al-Fadl's head and turned it around so that he didn't look at it. But you can't take part of it and not take the other. And you can't take a fatwa based on your desires, Ikhwan. This fatwa shopping, wallah, is a disease of the heart. It really is. The number of people I've seen, I take Sheikh al I take Sheikh bin Baz's opinion on this, I take... Ya Akhi, what is their opinion? You don't even know it. Wallah, you don't know, not the evidence, not the dalil, not the opinion, not where it... Only you look that it matches your hawa, that's it. It matches my desires, so I go with it. Ah, wallah, it's not like this. Rather, the person who is content for people to look at their wife, no doubt is a day youth, without a shadow of a doubt. The person who is content for people to look at their wife, they have a share of that. So a person should fear Allah with regard to their family, whether the sister wears niqab or doesn't wear niqab. As I said, my view is the niqab is compulsory. But even if she doesn't wear the niqab, still that doesn't neglect the issue of lowering the gaze and keeping the people away from her and protecting her honor, her honor and so on. <laughs> Which sheikhs and ustaz should we listen to? Allahumma musta'an. It's very hard, wallahi. Because the problem is you mention somebody and tomorrow and you don't know what that person will say. For wallahi, I do not know anything better to be honest with you than to say that you should follow the people who have passed away. Because the people who are alive, you can't be sure that that person is not going to go into a fitna tomorrow. Wallahi, I, I personally don't really advise people for particular speakers for two reasons. The first thing is that, wallahi, many good speakers, I don't know them. So I say, for example, and I, you know, I live in like this Bedouin world when it comes to social media. I don't look at it. I don't care about the videos that are made. I don't look at Instagram, nothing like that. Other people do it for, I don't, don't take anything to do with it. So I don't know when there are good speakers and it would be unfair for me to say, you should only listen to Fulan and Fulan and Fulan, and I, there's many good speakers I don't know about. And also, if I mention someone with good, I don't know what that person will say tomorrow. I can't tell you what I will say tomorrow, let alone them. I can, wallahi, at the moment, me, myself, I'm working with Al Madrasat Al Umariya, with Sheikh Abdul Rahman Hassan, and wallahi, from what I have seen of uh, Sheikh Abdul Rahman's work and what I've worked with him for the last three, four years, I found his lectures to be extremely beneficial and from among the best of what is available in the English language. So I can't advise you other than that. There are many, many other great speakers and there are many fantastic du'at who are doing a great job and I don't take anything away from them. But I can only yani, tell you the people that I know personally and the people that I know well. So right now I'm working along with Sheikh Abdul Rahman Hassan with Al Madrasat Al Umariya. And other than that, Danny, I leave the matter to you, inshallah. When a masjid is teaching wrong things to people and they believe it, how should we deal with this? So it's very important to deal with issues with al hikmah wal mu'idat al hasana. Udu'u ila sabili rabbi. Call to the way of your Lord. Call to the way of your Lord. You need to call to the way of your Lord bil hikmati wal mu'idati al-hasan with wisdom and with good admonition. Wajadilhum bil latihi ahsan and argue with them in the way that is best. What does that mean? So first of all, is that we call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're not calling to personalities. I'm not saying don't go to his masjid because he doesn't invite me to speak there. I'm not calling to myself. Call the people to Allah. Call the people to the Quran and to the Sunnah and to what the companions were upon. Call to the way of your Lord, the Kitab and the Sunnah, wa ma ajma alayhi salafu hadhi al-ummah, what the early generations agreed upon. That's what I call to. Do I get it right? No, sometimes I get it wrong. But that's what I call to. 
So call the people to Allah, to the Quran, the Sunnah, and what the early generations were upon. That's the first thing. Call them with hikmah. What does hikmah mean? It means that you know when to speak up and when to be silent. You know when to be harsh and when to be soft. You know when to bring a certain angle and when to go from a different angle. And that requires knowledge and practice. And when you admonish people, admonish people in the best way. And don't be someone who is, yani someone who is, you just hear curses and bad words from them. And I want you to reflect on what Allah said to Musa and Harun when they went to Fir'aun. Say to Fir'aun, Fir'aun who is the worst of the people, say to him a soft word. Perhaps he will remember or perhaps he will fear Allah. If Fir'aun deserves a soft, gentle word, then the people who are better than Fir'aun also deserve a soft and gentle word. And when you have to argue with people, because sometimes the people will not accept it from you. We'll say, no, what I'm teaching is correct, you're wrong. When you have to argue with them, argue in the best possible way. Don't go down to their level, don't go down to insults and screaming and shouting at people, but discuss with them and give your evidences and explain to them in the best possible way. And be sincere like you're looking at yourself. Give sincere advice to people as though you were giving it to yourself. And if you do this, inshallah ta'ala, many of those people will change. And I think in our time, and I don't mean today, but in recent times, wallahi, that from the best examples of this, if you look at some of the advices that Sheikh, uh, Sheikh bin Baz rahimahullah ta'ala gave to people, wallahi, you'll find in it a very, very good example of how to deal with people, how to deal with al-mukhalif, the one who is against you and the one who has fallen into innovations and misguidance. Allah the Shaykh gave an excellent example for our modern times of how to deal with people like that. Can we give zakah money for somebody to build a house? The most important thing is that zakah has two aspects to it when we talk about giving it. The first is that you must give it to the groups that are mentioned. إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتُ لِلْفُقَرَاءِ وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَالْعَامِلِينَ عَلَيْهَا وَالْمُؤَلَّفَةِ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَفِي الرِّقَابِ وَالْغَارِ مِنْهُ وَفِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَبِنِ السَّبِيلِ Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned these categories, the eight categories of the people who are due zakah. For this purpose of this question, we're talking about two. إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتُ لِلْفُقَرَاءِ وَالْمَسَاكِينَ The extremely poor who have nothing at all, and the ones who have money but it's not enough for their basic needs. The second thing is, how do you give that zakah to them? You give it in the form that you had it. Yani you give it, for example, if it's zakah on money, you give it in money. You don't say to them, for example, I will buy you food or I will buy you clothes. Rather, you give it into them in money for them to buy. Allahumma, unless you fear that they will waste that money, that's a different issue. So the, we said it has to be a faqir or miskin, someone who has nothing or someone who has less than the basics that people need. And the second thing is, if your zakah is zakah upon gold and silver and money, then you give it in that form. You don't give somebody, a, you know, a pallet of bricks or something like that. You give them the zakah and they choose what to do with it. But there might be some exceptions to that and maybe specific cases could be asked about and Allah is what knows best. Four more questions and then inshallah we quickly round the brothers and we try to finish inshallah. How do you tell Muslims to pray? So there are two aspects of telling Muslims and encouraging Muslims in Islam. The first is called at targhib and the second is called at tarheeb So at targhib means encouraging them with positive messages. So you're telling them about Jannah, you're telling them about the reward for the people who pray, the nearness to Allah, Surah Al-Fatiha is a conversation between you and Allah, and Allah says, This is for my servant, and my servant will have whatever they ask for, showing them how easy it is to pray, facilitating for them, encouraging them and helping them. This is all targheeb, encouragement. Then there is targheeb, they're scaring them and warning them. So you tell them, when Allah Azza wa Jal spoke about the people of hellfire, مَا سَلَكَكُمْ فِي سَقَرْ قَالُوا لَمْ نَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُصَلِّينَ The first thing they said is, we didn't used to pray. And the Prophet said, the difference between us and them is the prayer, and whoever leaves it has disbelieved. 
So the leaving of the prayer is so serious that a person could leave the religion of Islam completely. And then you encourage them with all the goodness and the rewards of praying. And this dual approach, inshallah ta'ala, as well as making it easy. Like for example, someone says, look, I cannot imagine coming to the masjid to pray. Okay, let's just start by you just praying where you are. We make a little jama'ah at home. You know, just make your wudu, you just pray your prayer and, and we'll build on it. We'll go stages until you come into the jama'ah five times a day, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Okay, rites and rituals, are what rites and rituals are prescribed for marriage? That's a big question. That would be better to deal with as part of a marriage course. But I will recommend a series of books. Wallahi, from the best of what I have seen written on the topic of marriage is a four book series by Sheikh Muhammad al-Jibari. It's a very, very beautiful series. The Sheikh did a fantastic, fantastic job. He used to be my neighbor in Medina. Uh, Wallahi, he did an amazing job, a fantastic job of going through the evidences as they relate to marriage, preparing for marriage, the ceremony of marriage, intimacy, and children, and all of that. Very, very nice. I recommend, I would give this book as a gift to anyone who says they're thinking about getting married. Or anyone who's married even, yeah, and he will still benefit from it. And he give them this, it's four, four books, and it's commonly known by the term the marriage series by Sheikh Muhammad al Jibari. It's very, very beneficial. Um, we mentioned that Allah hates and loves certain behaviors. Can you elaborate on what Allah hates and whether this ties in with non believers? Uh, should we not approach a non-Muslim as though they were someone who has you know, who could become Muslim? This is a very, very good question and very important. So let's recap what we said on the issue of Al-Wala' wal bara We mentioned the ayah, or well, I started mentioning the ayah. قَدْ كَانَتْ لَكُمْ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ فِي إِبْرَاهِيمِ فِي إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَالَّذِينَ مَعَهِ إِذْ قَالُوا لِقَوْمِهِمْ إِنَّا بُرَآءُ مِنْكُمْ وَمِمَّا تَعْبُدُونَ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ كَفَرْنَا بِكُمْ وَبَدَا بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمُ الْعَدَاوَةُ وَالْبَغْضَاءُ أَبَدًا حَتَّى تُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَحْدَهُ This ayah in Surah Al-Mumtahana. There has certainly been for you an excellent example in Ibrahim and those with him. When they said to their people, we are free from you and what you worship besides Allah. We have disassociated ourselves, we've denied you. And there is between us and you enmity and hatred forever until you believe in Allah alone. Allah says this is an excellent example. At the same time, Allah says, لا ينهاكم الله عن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين ولم يخرجوكم من دياركم أن تبروهم وتقسطوا إليهم إن الله يحب المقسطين Allah does not forbid you from those people who have not fought you for your religion or driven you out of your homes for being righteous towards them and fair towards them. These two ayat cannot contradict each other. And they did not come with, yani, they did not come uh, for only a, a, spe a special set of circumstances. Yani. So both ayat have to be applied. First of all, we disassociate ourselves from the non-Muslims and from what they do. Allah Azza wa Jal hates disbelief and Allah Azza wa Jal hates the disbelievers. By the text of the Quran, we don't need, I mean, this is proven by the text of the Quran in more than one place. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates the disbelievers and Allah hates disbelief. And we don't just say that Allah hates disbelief but doesn't hate the disbeliever. Rather, Allah hates the action and the person without a shadow of a doubt. And Allah hates every evil action and every person who does it to the extent that they do it. So for example, someone who does some mistake sometimes is not the same in the sight of Allah as the person who disbelieves. And the person who disbelieves and is looking for Islam is not the same as the person who hates Islam and tries to pull people away from it. All of them have a status in the sight of Allah. But Allah does not prevent us despite this hatred. Allah does not prevent us from being kind, nor does Allah prevent us from being just. Someone might say, how can I be kind to someone that I hate? The answer is that the reason you're being kind to them is from love of Allah. Because Allah commanded you to be kind to them, and so out of love of Allah, you're kind to them. And he's polite, you give a good impression of Islam, 
you explain Islam nicely to them, you help them to understand, you are fair to them, you don't cheat them, you don't lie to them, you don't steal from them. And all of these things that Allah commanded you and you do that because Allah told you to do it. So out of your love of Allah, you treat them kindly, fairly, justly, and you explain Islam to them in a beautiful way. And if they accept Islam, فَإِخْوَانُكُمْ فِي الدِّينَ They become your brothers in the religion. They become your brothers in the religion. As for before that, then they are not your brothers or sisters. But they are people that Allah has commanded you to be fair towards them. And Allah has commanded you to be kind towards them in the limits of what Allah Azza wa Jal said in these ayat. At the same time, we're not on the same team. We're not friends. We're not allies. We're not together. And you rather, there is enmity and hatred because I have to hate what Allah hates. At the same time, Allah has commanded you, me to be kind to you. So out of love of Allah, I'm going to be kind to you and I'm going to be fair to you as Allah has commanded me to be. And wallahi, the ajeeb thing I find about this, to be honest with you, is I find that non-Muslims understand this very well. They have excellent wala wal bara. Like many non-Muslims have an excellent sense of the fact that, look, we're together, you know, we're allies, you know, and they have this excellent sense of being against the Muslims and away from them and so on. And yet, subhanAllah, we as Muslims feel like confused, you know, like who should we be with or whose team are we on? We shouldn't be confused. But it doesn't stop us from being fair to the non-Muslims. It doesn't stop us from giving a nice explanation of Islam. But you can't join us until you're one of us. If they repent and they in Tabu, wa aqamu salah and they perform the prayer, wa atu zakah and they give the zakah, fa ikhwanukum fi din. Then you, they are your brothers in the religion. Nah. Last one on paper, and then we'll see if any the last ones for the brothers. I'm a new Muslim, and I feel unsettled in the area I live in. I'm unmarried and a single parent, and I can't move to a Muslim uh, area as I take care of my sibling. What should I do if I can't make hijrah? So there's no doubt that new Muslims undergo a number of unique challenges. And wallahi, these challenges, they are not easy to bear. But we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise their rank and to bless them with the best of this world and the next because of these difficulties and challenges that they face. So it's very important when these challenges are happening that we bear in mind two things. The first thing is that we try to reduce the evil as much as we can. So if the person says, look, I can't move, okay. But what can you do to maximize the benefit? For example, try to come and spend more time with the Muslims in a, in a more Muslim friendly area. Uh, try to spend time at the masjid. Try to bring the Muslims to your, to, you know, to your place, to stay with them, to be around Muslim uh, any people. Try to reduce the evil. And the second thing that we can do is that we as a community have to support them. So when we hear of a revert going through difficulty, we have to support them at the end of the day. Just like you would support your own family. So you have to support your family that are your family in Iman and Islam. Innamal mu'minuna ikhwa. The believers are none but brothers. So we have to have this connection with people. So we, for example, we make an effort to visit them. We make an effort to be in touch with them, to take phone numbers and so on, and call them and ask how they are. And we make an effort to invite them to our homes and we make an effort to visit them and we make an effort to connect them to the community so that they, even if they have to live in that place, and if they live in that place knowing that they have the support of the Muslim community. And also trying to find out ways to get out. Because if a person is sincere, Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا Whoever has taqwa of Allah, any whoever protects themselves from Allah's punishment, whoever does the best they can to obey Allah, and the best they can to keep away from disobedience to Allah, Allah will make them a way out. But we have to be sincere looking for it. So whenever that opportunity comes to find a way out, that you take it and may Allah Azza wa make it easy for you to find that way out. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from you. Uh, do we have any questions from the brothers? Because I know you've been waiting patiently and what happens is we get these papers and they go... Uh, I have a friend Does God define our goals in life or is it more along the lines of karmic balance, i.e. be a good person? Mm. That's follow-up questions as well. Very, very good question. So, uh, a person is asking the question, is it God that defines our goals in life 
or is it more about just being a good person? So there's no doubt that the best one to define your goals in life is for God himself, right? Because he knows everything. He knows what is best for you. He created you. He knows what is going to be good for you and what's going to be bad for you. And we as human beings regularly get that wrong. We regularly get that wrong. Maybe you hate something and it's really good for you. And reverse, maybe you love something and it's really bad for you. So ultimately, it's not just about being a good person, but it's about the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, has given us a purpose in life. And that purpose is defined for us. So for example, if I give you the example of a car. A car was manufactured for a purpose. It was manufactured to drive. And yes, it is possible to take a car and stick it on your driveway and let it rust until the wheels fall off. But you never got out of it what it was made for. It wasn't made to leave on your drive and then let the wheels fall off from rust and decay. It was made to drive. The reason we know it's made to drive is because it was manufactured, it was made by someone that made it for a reason. Allah made you for a reason. He made you to worship Him. And unless you fulfill that purpose, you'll be like that car that is rusting on someone's driveway. And he, we're not saying there's no benefit at all, but you won't get out of your life what you want from it. At the same time, does that mean that our deeds have no effect upon our life? No, our deeds do. The good that we do, the bad that we do. Whoever does an atom's worth of good, the consequences of that, they're going to see it. And whoever does an atom's weight of bad, the consequences of that, they're also going to, they're going to see it in their life. They're going to experience it. If not in this life, then in the next. Then the question comes, does that mean that we as Muslims are like robots? We're not allowed to have our own goals and dreams and, and him and, and our our aspirations. No, we're allowed to have them, but within the context of Islam. And that's why some people, for example, Allah has given them success in charity. And they want to give charity and be good. You know, they, they love helping people. And that's their means to paradise. Allah has given them a means within the permissible means of getting paradise. Allah has given it to them. And so those goals that they're striving for are within what Islam allows. But for example, there are some goals that a person is not allowed. Like gathering wealth and status for the sake of it. Allah said, The one who gathers wealth and counts it. And in front of the poor says, look how much money I have. I've got all this money. Look how much money I've got. Either they spend their whole day counting how much money they have, or they spend their whole day reminding the poor people of how much money they have. Allah threatened them with the hellfire for this. So there are some things that you cannot have as your goals and purposes. And that's the essence of Islam, right? Submitting to Allah. Islam is about submission. Meaning that you take your desires and your goals and you bring them in line with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from you. And that's why we consider or we call ourselves Muslim people who have submitted. So I hope that answers, inshallah ta'ala, the question. No problem, Shah. Then he asks, how does God define our goals and how do you know that you're on the right path? It's a very good question. How does God define our goals and how do you know that you're upon the right path? So the first thing is that the answer to these two can probably be brought together and say that it's scripture <coughs> and prophethood that tell us what is right and wrong. So Islam often gives us general goals without necessarily giving us details in every single aspect. That allows us to be individuals, right? Like Allah said, خُذِ الْعَفُوا وَأْمُرْ بِالْعُرْفِ وَأَعْرِفْ عَنِ الْجَاهِلِينَ Take to pardoning people. And allow that which is customary. And that's one of the tafsir of the ayah. Allow that which is customary. And allow people to be their own individual. وَأَعْرِفْ عَنِ الْجَاهِلِينَ And turn away from those who are ignorant. So that tells us that people do have a certain amount of flexibility where they are allowed to choose things for themselves within the framework set by Islam. What is the framework set by Islam? It's scripture and prophethood. Scripture is the revelation, the Quran, and the Sunnah, yani the revelation that was given to the Prophet Muhammad. 
And so when a person looks at scripture and prophethood, they tell us what is right and wrong. And that's why in Surah Al-Fatiha, in the very first Surah of the Quran, what do we ask Allah for? إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطُ الْمُسْتَقِيمُ Guide us to the straight path. That path is defined. لَيْلُهَا كَنَهَارِهَا its night is like its day. لا يزيغ عنها إلا هالك. No one goes away from it except they're destroyed. So there is no issue with knowing what is right and wrong when you follow scripture and you follow the way of the prophets. عليهم الصلاة والسلام. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them all. That is how we know what is right and what is wrong. And that's how we know what our purposes are defined by. That doesn't stop you being an individual. It doesn't stop you having tastes and likes and dislikes. But it does set you towards a common goal that unites us and brings us together. And that is to worship Allah alone and with no partner and to follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Do we have any last, last questions from the brothers? I think we make this last one, inshallah. It's very late for the brothers. Yeah. And, uh, what are your thoughts on Dabis? I've answered this question many, many times. So I'm, again, I'm going to give you a summarized answer, inshallah. The detailed answer is on my YouTube channel for plenty of people to see. There is no doubt that when it comes to uh, ta'weez, that is what sometimes people call tama'im, amulets, or things that are hung for protection. There are two types. There is a ta'weez which is from the Qur'an, and a ta'weez which is not from the Qur'an. As for the ta'weez which is not from the Qur'an, then this one there is no doubt about it. There is no doubt in it being prohibited. And there is no doubt if a person believes that it benefits them instead of Allah, then they left the religion of Islam. And if a person believes Allah benefits them through it, then they have committed shirk on asghar, minor shirk. And this is for the ta'weed that is not from the Quran. As for the ta'weed that is from the Quran, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an used to consider it to be haram. And this is the gen and generally what the Sahaba were upon, in general, that the ta'weed from the Qur'an is haram. As for, again, uh, the ta'weed which is from the Qur'an, it has another problem, which is that it is a dhari'ah to shirk. It leads people to shirk. How? Because people believe that their ta'weed is from the Qur'an when it's not from the Qur'an. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about those people. يَلْوُونَ أَلْسِنَتَهُمْ بِالْكِتَابِ لِتَحْسَبُوهُ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ وَمَا هُوَ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ وَيَقُولُونَ هُوَ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ وَمَا هُوَ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ وَيَقُولُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبَ وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ There are people who twist their tongues with the recitation of the book to make you think it's from the Qur'an, but it's not from the Qur'an. And they say that it's from Allah, but it's not from Allah. And they speak about Allah a lie while they know. I've opened, I don't know, I don't have a number, but I would say certainly over a thousand, maybe more than that of the different amulets and ta'weez people brought. And I could probably count on one hand, definitely within two, the number that were from the Qur'an. Almost everybody believed it was from the Qur'an. And I told you a story before, but I'll just briefly mention it. That one, one time sticks in my mind, one of the rare times. So I used to have a deal. I used to say, bring me your ta'weez. I'll open it. If it's from the Qur'an, I'll give it back to you. Even though I believe it's haram, but I'll give it back to you. Because you, you know, some of the tabi'een might have allowed it. and oh, No problem, I'll give it back to you. So one brother came, he said, okay, I've heard you have a deal. If you open this ta'weed, if it's from the Quran, you're going to give it back. I said, yeah, he goes, open it. So I open it. And it's a printed page from the Quran. It's not written, it's not handwritten. I mean, someone went to Quran.com and pressed print. Yeah. <laughs> it was not anything. I said, look, Alhamdulillah, it's a printed page from the Quran. He goes, what? What? He cheated me. He lied to me, this guy. He told me he's doing some amal, some proper work for me, and he just printed the page from the Quran. Wallah, they don't even want the ta'weez to be from the Quran. They want it to be from, yeah, and he, all these squares and symbols and letters that all of the scholars of Islam unanimously agreed are from the shirkiyat and al bid'ah, the things that are making a partner with Allah and bid'ah and so on. Nobody wants to have a ta'weez like this. As for the ta'weed from the Qur'an, I feel the majority of Muslims are fooled. People don't know what's the Qur'an. The average person, if I wrote poetry and gave it to them and said it's Qur'an, they will believe me. If I wrote any random letters and said it's Qur'an, they believe me. If I scribble and wrote it and said it's Qur'an, they believe me. If I draw symbols, if I draw shapes, 
you know, circle square, circle square, it's Quran, they believe me. This is the jahl that the people are living in. For this is why I believe it's a dhari'ah to shirk. It's a means for people to make a partner with Allah. And that's why I completely agree with the statement of Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu an, that the ta'weed is haram, whether it's from the Quran or whether it's not from the Quran. We have a detailed answer, by the way, to those people who say the Sahaba used to wear ta'weed. I have already answered that question in detail with the evidences from the Musannaf ibn Abi, ibn Abi Shayba rahimahullah ta'ala and others. Uh, we've already responded to that. Okay, I think it's a good place for us to start. Uh, somebody's just texted me with a question. Can I ask you? Tfadal. <laughs> well, it's a bit longish and it's a... Okay. Khitam hu misk, inshallah. So it goes. In your talk, you mentioned that Quran is a jigsaw puzzle. Okay. Can you shed more light on this, please? Okay. And it goes on mm. to shake. Let's give you the, uh, okay. the joining bits to this. Um, can you also provide some guidance on how best to approach it without deviating from the true meaning and then he also there's another part to this we have english translations of the quran uh, but they're not accurate as the quranic arabic how do the non-arabic speakers get around this mm. what sources would you recommend type and that's true? all that i can remember so a uh, hasbuk <laughs> that's all i can remember so first of all uh, I think the problem is sometimes people hear a bit of what you say, but they don't really listen to the whole thing or catch the whole thing that you said. I definitely didn't say the Quran is a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, I think what I was saying is that these three ayat fit together like a jigsaw puzzle, in the sense that each one of them complements the other. That's what I meant. So what I meant here is not that the Quran is a jigsaw puzzle, the Quran is Quran. But what I meant is that the Qur'an fits together. The ayat don't contradict each other. They don't go on top of each other. They fit together to make a complete picture. That's something, yani that's a, a, what you call it, an analogy or whatever you call it, simile or something like that. So I can't remember. But it's, some, it's, yani it's basically giving you something, what we call taqribul fahm, helping you to understand by saying that the ayat don't clash against each other. Rather, the ayat, they are complementary and they fit together like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Type. That's one point. The next point is, how does a person approach the tafsir of the Qur'an? There's no doubt that it's true that translations of the Qur'an, translation of the meaning of the Qur'an, all this is, is this is the translator's tafsir and translation combined. This is very important. A lot of people make a big mistake in this. They believe that a translation is a word-for-word, -word, literal, you know, bringing of the Arabic into English. This is mustahil, it's impossible. Because words in Arabic have many, many meanings. And sometimes one ayah could have eight meanings. And there can be differences of opinion in it. So the translator has to first of all make tafsir and then bring the tafsir into English. It has to be like that. So they cannot, for example, when the translator says, for example, for example, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا I only created the jinn and the men to worship me alone. In reality, this is tafsir first. The first thing I did is make tafsir of the ayah and then translate it. It's not a translation of the ayah because the words are too deep. For example, the statement of Ibn Abbas doesn't agree with that tafsir. And the statement of Ibn Abbas is excluded from the translation that I gave you. That's not the tafsir of Ibn Abbas at all. So the point is that I first of all made tafsir and then I brought the translation. And that's the case of all translations of the Quran. The best option that you can do is to learn two things. Number one, to strive to learn the Arabic language. That's the first thing. To strive to learn the Arabic language. Don't say it's too hard, Arabic's gonna take me too long, I won't understand the Quran. Wallah, two years of hard work. I'm not gonna say you understand the Quran like a native, but you will understand a good amount of the Quran in two years of hard work. The next thing is, uh, take a subject which we call Usul al-Tafsir. The principles of Tafsir. You can find the video, just go on to AMAU and type in Tafsir. Uh, go to YouTube, go to AMAU and type in Tafsir. There should be a video, I'm sure Sheikh Abdul Rahman has one, uh, which is called 
al-muqaddimah fi usul al-tafsir. I'm just going to double check. It's on our YouTube channel. It's not on Kalimas. It might be on Kalimas. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah, it is eight parts. The usul of tafsir of Ibn Taymiyyah by Sheikh Abdurrahman Hassan. This one you can find it very nice. It will explain to you how to approach tafsir. And how do we even make tafsir of the Quran? Where does tafsir even come from? For example, tafsir al Quran ibn Quran. Sometimes the Quran explains itself. Tafsir al Quran bi sunnah. Sometimes the sunnah explains the Quran. Tafsir al Quran. The tafsir of the Quran from the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. The tafsir of the Quran from the Imams of the Tabi'een. Then the tafsir of the Quran in the Arabic language, to what extent do we accept it or not accept it? There's this all is discussed, the approach to tafsir, understanding the Quran. Just type in AMAU tafsir and look for a video series called Usul al Tafsir, Usul al Tafsir ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah's Usul in Tafsir. It's very, very good and it's eight parts. Each one is about half an hour long. So, inshallah, you'll benefit from it, bithnillah. What else was there in the question? That was it. Or there's some more parts. I think we have, to, we have to stuff it there. That's what Allah Azza wa made easy for me to mention. Allah knows best. Wassalatu wassalamu ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Uh, one, just one small point.